Welcome everybody to Bitcoiners Guide. This is the show, the podcast that we wish we would have had when we first started learning about Bitcoin. So we made it for you. We're your host, Big Sean Harris and Plan Marcus in the building. And we're joined today by our special guest, Bitcoin Graffiti. Guys, Marcus Graffiti, how's your trades going? Good morning. Yeah, going well. Guys? Trade's going good. Yeah, trade's going fine. Bad? Yeah, I like I, I guess the halving is still not priced in, I guess. So it's, uh, it's just stacking. I think it could never be priced in until it happens. Why? I disagree. No, I'm playing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm starting off yeah. arguing with the, with the Miami energy. Everyone wants to argue nowadays. <laughs> Yeah, we got to get into that some other time because I'm very uh, curious to hear all your uh, wild stories there, Sean. Because uh, you know, you you've, you've you've shown us a little bit in the chats, and I think we could make like a whole episode of your um, outs and about at uh, at Miami. That, that could be a good idea for a show. There's some things can't share, right? But uh, I will say <laughs> this: my voice was gone. So we the conference went Friday, Saturday, basically, and my voice was gone by Sunday. Sunday, all day Sunday, I couldn't, I couldn't speak. Everything was gone. It's still like today is what Thursday, and it's still. But well, that's that's a good thing, right? Because I think today we have a guest who, in my opinion, I mean, we're gonna find out, of course, but you know, we're gonna go a little bit more intellectual uh, today than usual. And uh, if I think of the Miami conference, right, we ended up talking about Udi and, uh, and the clown wizards all the time, even though I've heard very little about, for instance, well, how meaningful it was that um, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., you know, what he had to say. And um, I think yesterday we had Ron DeSantis announce his um, presidency from the Republican side. Mm -hmm. And he's also very, he made some very pro-Bitcoin uh, statements. So, yeah. It's There's good. so much happening on that side, and here we are fighting about getting ordinals on the thing. So, anyway, your voice shouldn't be a problem <laughs> today right. because, uh, yeah, I'm looking to you now to make the bridge <laughs> to introduce. <laughs> okay. All right, I wasn't sure where we were going with that. All right, well, today yeah. we have Bitcoin graffiti, as we said. Uh, graffiti, uh, we don't really do a ton of um. Right. Right. We we don't want to we don't want to hinder where the creativity can go from here. We like just chatting about Bitcoin, about what you like to talk about, and we kind of just want to start off with what you know what's kind of been sparking your mind lately um, in the Bitcoin world or in the philosophy of Bitcoin. You know what what's kind of been getting you excited lately? Wow, yeah, I mean that's that's like a deep question to start off with. Um, Maybe like should should I do like a short introduction? You know. Yes. Yeah. So, I think that I think that would be best. For, maybe for the viewers. Yes. Yeah. So like I haven't been that long in Bitcoin yet uh, since uh, like just after the Corona pandemic. Actually, um, I was actually just getting into the, the stock market, and you know the whole thing went down, and then it sprung up, and I was like, "What is going on?" And that like triggered me to like go more into you know like how does this work what's going on with the money and then i figured out like ooh, like, are you, are you i think they're manipulating the michael saylor right after <laughs> <laughs> it, it was sort of like around the same time yeah, yeah. like we had yeah. sort of like a, a similar experience I, I have to say like he was very key for me to like uh like you know take on like go more into more into bitcoin um, I, I was actually mainly triggered by the way he explained it um, from like a more like a, a philosophy of science kind, uh, kind of uh, point of view yeah. where he described it as more like a paradigm shift. And that was like one of my favorite uh, topics at university. You know, like I was always intrigued by, you know, like these big shifts in, in, in society, you know, like how did we transition from... Uh, you know, the the view that the world was flat or like the view that the earth was at the center of the universe. And then some crazy guys coming up saying like, well, you know, maybe that isn't the case, you know, maybe uh, we're all revolving around the sun. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in, in a way, Bitcoin, I, I see it's it's similar almost, right? Like, 
you, you first think like it like money is this and then you're like oh no actually it's 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 totally different so but by him explaining it as as like such a shift that like got got me triggered because it, it's yeah that, that's hard to miss like i remember at at university th this subject philosophy of science where you go into like what is science you know and like how does it like change over time it it, it was such a hated subject most people most students didn't like it uh, you know and i, I was surrounded by yeah. chemists phys, phys yeah go ahead i was gonna say I, we always talk about that bitcoin is this mindset shift in and for a lot of us that have gone down that rabbit hole, we can we can see that it is a mindset shift. But I kind of want to dive deeper into what is the mindset shift? Like, what are we shifting from, and what are we shifting to? Well, I think we we build our lives on assumptions. I guess, and fiat money is one of those uh, assumptions. Basically, you, you organize your whole life around getting fiat money, go to work Monday to Friday, 40 hours a week, and, and, and that's how you do it, right? And, and you never question the commodity you're working for and whether that's like the best thing to like trade your time for, right? And And I guess Bitcoin like puts this upside down where it says like listen you get you know save your time in in a different medium which is better which, which doesn't lose its uh purchasing power over time so and that's such a that's such a widespread assumption that it's so like it, it becomes so painful i guess to like change it also and and that's like part of the process, I, I guess, also with the orange pilling and and the, and the shift to this new system, where you just like completely have to look like reevaluate how you've been doing things and now you look at the world. Yeah, it's kind of interesting, right? Because going back to your analogy of like, um, I don't know what century it was, but when they believed um, that the Earth was flat and was at the center of the universe, and then um, you know, through astronomy, people figured out that the earth is probably more like a sphere and it's, uh, you know, like uh, circulating or circling the sun. What about the, what about Ima the ice imagine, wall? What about the ice wall, Marcus? I, I was waiting for that joke to come, but I was going to let it pass this time. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, think about it, right? Imagine you're reading that or hearing about it on the town square. Like, oh my God, did you hear this news? You know, like we're actually living on a ball and then people dismissing it, of course. And people are getting angry about it. And, you know, because you have to kind of like rewire your brain to, to deal with this new idea or new reality. But at the same time, you can ask yourself what your your question was just asked. is like, okay, then what are we transitioning from? And how does that affect my daily life? I think for a lot of people, they have no idea, like, should I live my life differently now that, now that I know that the earth is not flat? I mean, it still feels flat. <laughs> it's like, and I mean... How do I use Bitcoin? Okay, so now am I going to pay with Bitcoin? You know, well, they maybe lack the foresight to see where the biggest implications might occur, you know, and how it will change the earth in the or the world in the long run. I think that's, you know, that made me, that was my thought when you asked, like, what are we transitioning from or what does that mean for us? Yeah, and, and, and it's also, I have to say, now looking back at my, fiat years i'd say i was pretty much financially illiterate um yeah, absolutely i think Same that's a, that's a big that that's just such a big uh part of it you know like if you can already talk about money having three functions you know medium of exchange store of value unit of account yeah. like i mean most people don't notice um i i i i always pick pick this up when i watch uh, american uh, sort of like business uh, news you know yeah. and in, in some of the shows fiat it is a term you know like that's yeah well, it was the, the Americans five years ago it wasn't yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's true but if for example if you compare it to the Netherlands there's there's no talk of fiat right so it, it it's it really depends where you live on on the earth I guess where you're at with your uh, financial literacy and, and in what kind of like monetary environment you live 
uh, uh, that determines how aware of these things, um, how aware of, you, of, of the problems you are, and, and perhaps also whether you perceive value in Bitcoin. Yeah, and it makes it interesting too, because you think about, I remember Gigi wrote an article about something like the words we use, something like that. And it's and it's kind of like each word, like, I mean, I remember when there was some news, uh, I don't know if it was like USA Today or who it was, and they said, fiat's not, you know, the, the dollar isn't some meme coin and fiat isn't a meme and all this other stuff. And when they said that, like when you fight against the meme, you actually end up becoming the meme. And fiat ended up becoming this meme kind of after that. And so it's funny as as we continue to correctly define words and then use them, then we don't have to, like once we define a word and it's defined correctly, then we don't have to explain what fiat is every second of the day. We can just call it fiat and then and then boom, it clicks. And then we can, and that'll help us explain what Bitcoin is and explain what sound money is along the lines. And I think that's, what's important about speaking truth and speaking through memes at times even. Yeah, exactly. It's there, there are just so many building blocks, I guess, for understanding Bitcoin and just realizing that, you know, I, I fought in these, I thought fiat money was limited in supply, you know, before 2020, <laughs> like, yeah. I'll tell you, like, I, now I look back at it and I'm like, I'll, it's almost like, hard to what say was, right what was now, I thinking? Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We and it seems so obvious it. now, but I, I can guarantee you still like a majority of the population probably has that, how do you say it? Like this latent thought in their mind that that's the way. They're not really thinking about it, but, you know, if it does come across their head, that's probably their assumption that I always thought, you know, like that when old bills, you know, like when I would get like a new crisp, hundred dollar bill in my hand or a new crisp euro uh, bill it's like oh so this is new money obviously but they yes. probably destroyed the old ones that they you know that that was just like this assumption in my head uh, i wasn't even but, I, honestly i wasn't even thinking about it i would just be like oh a crisp hundred dollar bill you know like i wasn't thinking <laughs> are they printing more how is it issued who's in control of it you know i wasn't thinking about any of that until it came time for me to actually think about my retirement, like, which, you know, I guess I started thinking about earlier than a lot of people. I think a lot of us as Bitcoiners, we just start questioning a lot of things and we want to make sure that we can make it through our life and be financially independent and not have to worry about, you know, some, some third party controlling all of our wealth. But it is, it is interesting. I think that's in 2019, it's interesting that you say that graffiti because in 2019, when the repo market broke and we just started printing billions of dollars every single day in around September, that's when it finally dropped for me that I was like, oh, we're never going to stop printing money. And the money that we printed in 2008 and on in QE, that's never going to stop. And we're never going to pay that off. It's only going to accelerate. Yeah, you, you need some kind of, I don't know, like to be put your like nose on the facts or something. You, you need some to have some kind of crisis moment where you're like, ooh, like, is this like system like actually working? You know, like it it doesn't seem like and And, and to me, the Corona pandemic and, and the crash and the V-shape recovery was was like, you know, it, it, enough it for me. Yeah. Exactly. And, and I was, um, you know, and then afterwards, a lot of things started making more sense to me, you know, like I, I was one of the questions I was always walking around with was like, why do these houses keep going up in prices? You know, like it, it doesn't yeah. make sense. Like, I mean, it's still the same house, right? Like how can it it's go older. up? It's older, right? Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's deteriorating actually. Yeah. Like how, how could it go up? And then now it's like, oh, wait, like the house aren't going up. The money's going down. Oh, yes. my goodness. And and then like you see it everywhere, right? In the supermarket, bomb, like it's and it doesn't. And, and, and for me, as a I'd say a technologist for such a long time, it, it just didn't make any sense because, um, you know, I, I, I always thought from like a 
early age. I was like, you know, technology is great. You know, it's going to liberate us one day, you know, like we're going to have robots doing the work. The internet's going to make things more efficient. Computers, all the stuff, right? You, like we're only improving, 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 getting more energy efficient. A and I never connected the dots, you know, I was like, like, why, why aren't we seeing these, these benefits accrued to society? So, and there's so, only one, one explanation, I think, which is money printing. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously that makes me think of Jeff Booth and the price of tomorrow. Did that, is that a book that you read, you know, along those lines during that time to really think about why these prices keep going up, even though technology continues to, to move forward? Yeah, that was like a missing puzzle piece. I think his uh, his book, The Price of Tomorrow. I think it like came out like what was it like November twenty twenty or something. I, uh, I I re I read it almost when it came out, and t to me it was like ah uh, like finally here you know here's the explanation like this is what I didn't get all this all these years you know like because like I I was an optimist about technology you know I thought we were gonna go somewhere you know i i think the 90s was also like quite a optimistic uh decade you know there were like sci-fi shows and we're going to space and you know like all the guts that like we were like rubbing our hands you know like here here's the millennium you know this is gonna be great and i don't know after the millennium at least for me personally it felt like stuff was like unwinding you know like it was Segment, getting worse yeah. we got like yeah we got like iraq war dot com bus yeah. and and then the, the housing the space, the space was... shuttle got sunsetted you know like the space program from that <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah it's like yeah. yeah it was like it was it was getting a bit like Adler shrugged style you know like we were devolving you know this wasn't but the, are you are you saying right, that... but like I... i'm sorry are you saying that you're now like less optimistic about technology because personally i'm still very much like i had that same enthusiasm for technology as you and the same hope and yeah i remember watching shows like beyond 2000 and back in the day discovery channel was very much technology driven still i don't know what happened to that station i don't enjoy watching it as much anymore but yeah that went totally down the drain <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it's like really bad but back in the day those were like my favorite programs and i still think you know like we could solve a lot i mean look at bitcoin itself you know it's technology you know and we're able to like fix the money by you know coming up with new technologies to fix it so i'm still very much like a technology optimist and and, and stuff but the way you're framing it now i'm just curious because do, do you have a different view on that or are you now like less hopeful on technology no it's a it's a great question i'm i'm super bullish on uh technology um i agree with jeff booth that like technology is improving exponentially uh but you know to maybe start digging into like um one of the articles uh, i wrote on my medium um uh where i think this is generally not felt and and wasn't felt uh, for me between let's say 2001 until I got into Bitcoin is that everything was getting more expensive around me so if that's happening then like uh, how can you claim that technology is uh making our lives better right like we're by by seeing the prices going up we're, we're thinking like oh my goodness like there's more scarcity going on things are going backwards but you know I think the moment of realization is I think that you're measuring everything in fiat, right? And that's what makes you not see it. And and if you denominate everything in Bitcoin, you know, all the prices are going down. And and finally you see the technology gains reflected in the prices. So it, it's kind of a what kind of like glasses are you wearing, you know? Like are you wearing right. like green fiat glasses, you know, where you like measure everything in? Or you put on the orange glasses and see your life getting cheaper. Yeah, it's it's interesting, and, and it's not just and it's just not seeing your life getting cheaper. It is getting cheaper, right? Yeah. You got more money to spend. It's funny because I remember when I first got into Bitcoin Twitter, I would you know I was like looking at the OGs tweeting out there, and they're like, they're like, my house keeps getting cheaper and cheaper, and 
in Bitcoin, my this gets cheaper and cheaper in Bitcoin and it'll show the prices of, you know, over the years. And they'll go, all of this stuff that I that I own or all of these things that I want to buy keep getting cheaper in Bitcoin while they keep getting more expensive in the dollar. And I think that's what a lot of the like the crypto degens, if you want to call them that, that they get lost in too, is they go, well, I'm going to. I'm going to make a lot of money. Like they'll still say I made money on, you know, X, Y, Z crypto. And I think they don't realize it's like, well, take a step back. What is money in the first place? Did, what did you make? Was it dollars? And are you denominating it in dollars? Or are you denominating it in Bitcoin? Because there's an opportunity cost. If say you make some, some money, which is in dollars and some random crypto, but then Bitcoin outperforms that, well, then you've actually lost Bitcoin along the way. And that's your opportunity cost. And I think a lot of people don't, don't denominate in Bitcoin. They're only denominating in the dollar, which, which you know, I think Saylor really hit this home when people would, would tell him at the beginning when he was changing his, his balance sheet to Bitcoin, they said, well, when are you going to sell back into the dollar? And that was when you point out, well, when Argentina went from, you know, one to one, their currency, then one to 10, then one to 100, like, when would I ever flip, you know, from dollars and buy back into the Argentine peso? Like, you never would. And so I think that's what people don't realize is that the denomination is changing and and you should be measuring in Bitcoin and not in, in fiat currency, whether that's the Argentine peso or whether it's the US dollar. Yeah, it's it's such a point of view kind of, kind of thing, right? Like again back to the uh, analogy of like wearing glasses on your over your eyes that like I haven't checked the charts but like wasn't bitcoin already at all-time highs in like the Argentine peso, you know, like or or pretty close. Yeah, yeah. Like, I think so. it, yeah. it it just it really depends on like whether you measure it in like Turkish lira or yeah pesos or, exactly. or, or euros right i so saw like, a chart this month for... like uh, in our in turkey uh bitcoin is making all-time highs right now i believe and that's a reflection of the fiat right and that's a reflection of how broken that fiat currency is and and it's funny because remember when jack dorsey came out in like 2021 and tweeted something about hyper or hyperinflation and like that it's already here basically and all the legacy media just you know cnbc was going crazy oh he's fear-mongering oh you can't be in he's inciting this hyperinflation but if you take a look at it like at that time the dollar was like the dollar is hyperinflating if you measure it in bitcoin and so it just depends on how you measure something like what are you measuring it again and it feels like bitcoin captures and it sucks up all of these broken currencies. And yeah, the dollar does too, uh, because people still haven't figured it out yet. But over time, it, it just ends up making its way into Bitcoin because people realize, okay, this is a better place to store my wealth. Yeah, and, and I guess like hyperinflation, you can divide up into like stages, right? So like where the dollars may be in its first stages like the turkish lira is going hyperbolic you know and just look at the charts i mean that doesn't doesn't look uh, uh doesn't look good yeah no, it's and, and, and i get and, once it breaks once the trust is gone it's very hard to uh to restore and yeah and, 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 and of, go ahead go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> yeah i, I just want to say like how how devious the the unit of account actually is right because if you if you yeah. all your life have denominated prices in just one currency, you know that's basically a monopoly. You're you're just pricing something in a monopoly commodity, and you think that's the price of something, you know, but you never consider to like denominate it in something else, right? So like you're married to these glasses you're you're wearing, you know, you're married to your uh, unit of account. Like one of the like for the people who are on trading view you can like choose different denominators and and i always like um like to look at the chart uh s p 500 divided in gold for example mm -hmm. right. and and this sort of like proves my theory that we've been like stagnating since 2000 
because we haven't recovered from the dot com bubble. Uh, if you denominate it in ounces of gold, yeah, uh, you know it's still down. Like, yeah. can you believe it? You know, like if you were would have been like a gold holder, you would yes. have been outperforming the market. That's crazy. It it, it <laughs> is crazy that people don't look at this, and I think that's like the subtle. It is devious, right? It's the subtle trick. Like, if there's just a little bit of inflation, then people don't notice it. And if there's nothing crazy going on, there's not trillions of dollars being printed, then it then it gets swept swept under the rug. And they can keep stealing from us without us even knowing or playing these subtle tricks without us knowing. But once it starts to break and starts to bump up higher, like what we were seeing, you know, 8%, 9%, 10% inflation, then like a lot of warning flags show up for a lot of people and they start to go, well, you know, I can't even buy bonds because I'm losing money on a bond and, and everything that we used to think worked doesn't even work anymore. And so it's just, it's crazy how... Like the, like the little ploy of 2% inflation worked for so long and most people didn't even realize it. I guess Satoshi understood what was going on and um, and that's been able to light this fire inside a lot of us as we start to learn and start to feel those pain points from how- Exactly. So so we go from we go from like knowing nothing about money, right? To discovering Bitcoin, which opens your eyes to like how this actually works and you get brain- wave after brainwave about all these insights that start to make sense and all these analogies right so i just want to try to avoid like talking a little bit too much more about like these insights because we i think most of us and the most people watching the show you know we're familiar with all these insights but what we wanted to talk about was yeah. like okay so once you've seen it it feels like and i remember sailor saying this too like oh my god i felt like i had to rush into bitcoin before yeah the rest of the world wakes up and sees it, right? So he felt like this urge, like, oh my God, you know, it makes so much sense. This is this is so obvious. If I don't buy it by next month, you know, Bitcoin is going to be at a million dollars because everybody's going to be wanting to buy uh, Bitcoin. But obviously, I remember having that urge as, or that, that it's not an urge, it's like a rush, right? You feel you're, you're, you feel like in a yeah, race. Like a because panic, obviously, a panic almost. Like a yeah, panic, yeah. it's like, oh yeah. my God, you yeah. know, like I... I need to get this as soon as possible because in a couple of years, everybody's going to figure this out and we're going to hyper Bitcoinize or whatever. <laughs> and, 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 the, and the monetary system is going to collapse within yeah. no time. <laughs> yeah. So Which graffiti, you like, can you, can you kind of like, you know, just like take it from here and just, just like, mm -hmm. let us, you know, how have you been looking at that? You know, because you, you mentioned this article by Rogers I think most Bitcoiners are familiar with like the adoption curve and the S curve. You know, we have like the early innovators, you know, who came right after Satoshi. They were the first ones on the mailing list and started playing and tinkering with it. You know, like Laszlo uh, accepting pizza or wanting to buy pizza with it. You know, those were like the really early nerds, you know, who started playing with it, even though it didn't have a monetary value. Then you have like the, what what is it? The, the, the early adopters. And then you have the early majority. And where do you think we are in that curve? And what, you know, just throw at us like whichever direction you want to take it, how you've been looking at like this theory of, you know, how technology diffuses amongst the population or, or the globe. Yeah, so, so like you said, Plan, um, most people are familiar with the, the bell curve of these uh, adopter groups. So in, innovator through laggard, right? where the innovators are, are the first ones to like adopt a new technology because like they're either super nerdy or they got like a lot of money or they're very, very cosmopolitan and, and, and they're very international oriented. So, so they're like usually the first ones to like latch on to um, something new. Right. So that, that's what you just described with Lasso and the, and the cypherpunks and you know, the, the, the technology was uh, spreading there. And uh, so, so most people are familiar with those, um, with the S curve and the uh, adopter groups. Uh, but you know, there, there's a lot more uh, going on. So I, I read the, his book, The Diffusion of Innovations, uh, it's a couple of days ago. And, and there's like a lot of like great details you can uh, uh, take out of it. And I guess one of the first statements he makes is that um, the diffusion is like the, the spread of a technology is a social process and it's not really like related to the technology itself. 
So it's basically a, a communication problem, the spread. So um, what else did I want to say about it? So the, the first people who discovered uh, Bitcoin, for example, you know, they're like very expert people, you know, yeah. they, they know about cryptography, uh, you know, they were the first to adopt, like it, requi it, it requires quite a lot of work, frankly, to understand Bitcoin, especially in, in the early days, right? You have to be a cryptographer, basically to like hash like it out, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, it, it takes a while before there's like people in that group who, who can find some kind of like new language to like convey it to other people. And, and, and you know, this, this just takes time. And, and it also really depends on whether they see any value in it. So, so me, for okay. example, I really had to be edu educated on like financial stuff, right? Like I had to learn about fiat. That was maybe not necessary for the earlier adopters, right? Hmm. So, so what you see there is that this whole network where this like message needs to propagate through, it, it goes in like, like shocks a bit, you know, like, because like, we're not like a, it's not like an even evenly spread out network let's, let's say where the links are all the same right there are like social groups social cliques that have like different views of the world that like grow up in different parts of the world have a different kind of education uh have different means you know and and every group needs sort of like almost its own uh message and and this is one of the reasons why it's taking longer. And and I think also one of the big parts in it is that like Bitcoin is quite technical, you know, you need to have like a lot of know-how, um, also how to use it, you know, like, I mean, it's not that difficult, but it, you know, it takes some effort and I guess it needs a certain level of abstraction, I guess, um, in the early stages to like figure out what it's going to do because here we're sitting right like we know there's a happening event going to happen in a year but how many people are really convinced of it right like i'm i'm sure there's like loads of people who are going to be surprised again like oh like it will be in the media again right because it's going up because it just got like twice as scarce and, it, and it'll be a bubble again right you know it, it, yeah we're going to go through the same process <laughs> it, no it's tulips all over again yeah so um, um yeah you go ahead oh no i, <laughs> I thought i just let you around there's so many thoughts going through my head right now i mean yeah you know, i, I mean there, there's so many things so yeah th there's also so many things that i can say about rogers but like you know generally uh, innovation starts with high cosmopolite polite people you know like international people um people of high education who can grok grok the technology and um, maybe to give a good example, how the innovator mindset works. So those are like the, that's like the first cohort that adopts the technology. Mm -hmm. They don't mind having people around them who don't get it. Yeah. Right. Bas so let, let's say you have like a white and a black node in, inside like a social network graph and you're a black node and all your friends, all your close links, your family, your friends are white nodes. Right. So like you're the only one within their network who has adopted it. And, and, you know, like you have like far out, far out stretching links to like the other side of the ocean where, you know, somebody like you're connected to the Bitcoin community through Twitter or whatever, you know, that's like educating you on what is Bitcoin. Right. Because I, to, to be fair, like I didn't le learn from my friends. Like I think most people learn from the internet or Twitter. Right. Yeah. It's just like yeah. you just watch videos. Like there's, probably nobody around you in your social local network that tells you about it and and okay. this is the thing right so if you're the only one then first you're gonna like you know you you gotta handle that right that's not an easy thing you're just like surrounded by people who tell you you're maybe crazy this is a weird idea right you need you need like that, that takes a certain that kind of like uh... personality yeah, is that something you've experienced uh, lately or are experiencing? Um, How do you deal with that? Well, are well, you comfortable I, with it? It, it? In the beginning, I, I I found it was hard, I think, because you're you're so 
impressed by Bitcoin. You're like, oh my God, this is it. And, and you start telling it to all your friends and they're like, yeah, but what about this shit? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, like, I, I think this is the familiar thing, right? So like, it, it takes some determination, a confidence to like, stay with it. I, I think, especially when you might have like started at the top and have to like endure uh, like 80% drawdown. I mean, that's not like great, like advertising, right? Like, I mean, uh, people yeah. might laugh at you, right? So in, in the beginning, so, and and like, it's good also like to imagine how it looks, um, how we look from their point of view, right? So we're still anomalies. Like they are surrounded with other white nodes and you're the only black node. So how are they going to look at you? Well, you're an anomaly, right? You're the crazy guy who, uh, or, or girl who has like adopted this and, you know, like it's kind of strange and, you know, and this person is the only one. So they categorize us as anomalies, you know, we're weird. This is strange. This is not for us maybe. And, 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 and this is the characteristics, I guess, like of the innovator stage. So like the first cohort of like adoption, oh. we're still in like, I, Oh, it, it, this brings up to my mind something interesting because we go through all of this, right? Through all of this searching, studying for hours, hundreds, maybe thousands of hours, just nonstop trying to understand what Bitcoin is, talking with people, arguing, trying to hash it out in our minds. Our, you know, friends and family telling us that we're making a gambling risk and, and we go, no, it's not gambling. This is actually something real. And so the question is, you know, I was talking to a guy the other day in Miami saying, well, when Bitcoin does go to a million dollars or a couple million dollars, he's like, I'm going to feel like it's not fair because I didn't earn it, you know? And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, yeah, you didn't go out every single day. It's like, what? Like, you still decided to, like, this is the reward for going through all of that, in my opinion, is like, it's the reward of hodling, the reward of taking that risk on you know being the leader being the trendsetter is that you do get that reward at the end and i think that's not why you should do it but it's definitely an incentive for a lot of us to do it is that yeah the price of bitcoin is going to go up and and it's going to absorb everything and i think that's what a lot of people don't realize it's like i think a lot of people start to get an imposter syndrome um but it just puts us in a position it's like who would you rather i kind of asking this question of you know, who would you rather have all the wealth in that moment? Would you rather have the rent seekers that can press a button and, and make all the money or the people who did the work? You know, and I think that's it's it's to me, it's an obvious answer. Yeah, and, and you, I, I also think like as a early adopter, you sort of like prop up the rest of the Bitcoiners too, right? Like even if you don't propagate the word of Satoshi, let's say, you know, you're still hodling, right? So you're not dumping those things back on the market. Like in a way, you're sort of like stabilizing the the price, right? So in a way, you do contribute uh, still. And and yeah, well, and given the fact that like most of my friends or the people around me don't get it or like not engage with it, don't want to adopt it. And it's like very hard to like explain to them or persuade them that this, that this is something to adopt makes me think we're like still super early you know this is still the yes. two and a half percent the adopter stage and, and this is still the area for people to make like uh, a big advantage and be early on bitcoin as a reward of like grokking it out early because part of this uh, adoption process is also because you, you gotta have to think also about the other cohorts right so like after the innovator, you get the early adopter and then the early majority and the late majority. So you also got to think like, what, what's their reason for being late also, right? Like why be a laggard? You know, why are there laggards? Why why doesn't everybody get it at once? So why are there? Yeah, so Roger says that, um, um, well, part of the reason there is the diffusion actually is that people are not the same, right? people are different yeah so and and because like if everybody would be the same there would be no diffusion and everybody would get it instantly this is not the case and some uh, make uh, decisions in a different fashion 
for example, um, with more adopters, uh, let, let's say you're a white note, you're, you haven't ad adopted Bitcoin yet. Mm -hmm. And suddenly with time passing, one friend starts adopting Bitcoin, then a second one, and then a third one. And suddenly your network or like the way you walk for your life, suddenly your social uh, network has like 30 or 40% adopted it. And now we get a change, right? Because like before the, the black nodes were just the crazy ones, right? They, they were, you know, there was just one person in the network who, who did it. And then suddenly you have like two or three touch points. And now they are thinking like, hmm, wait a second. Th this, there, there must be something to it, right? Because otherwise, why would I suddenly have like more people in my network doing that? So, and this is more of like the early adopter mindset, right? They more of they they go more on like the cues of people in their network, and and, and this is also the uh, where people get uh, persuaded best, right? Most people get persuaded by their friends, not not through like a YouTube video. That that's more for the innovators. Other people go off by their by their friends, right? That's how they choose things. Yeah, I completely agree. And I mentioned earlier, you know, like looking at like other technologies, whether it's the iPhone or when Instagram came out or, you know, even further back, you know, you had like the internet, the radio, the television, the newspaper, you know, like it's all these curves and it, all these curves, they do show <laughs> that like once you hit somewhere between 20 and 30%, all of a sudden, it, like the adoption curve just steepens radically, right? So it's like this critical mass that you're referring to, like in your example Correct. with the nodes once once like about 20 or 30 percent of the nodes turn black in your analogy then all of a sudden people start flipping really really fast and then you also hit like a bend around the 74 percent mark where like the last 30 to 20 percent are the really hard ones they're probably never going to switch until they like physically die <laughs> you know whether i mean yeah. think about your grandfather who doesn't still doesn't know how to use a computer for instance you know they're they're almost gone now but um, yeah. yeah and and that explains the s curve right that's that's yeah. how technology spread and and there's yeah. a I, I, I there's a, a point to make about laggards because um for us we have like a pro innovation bias which means like we're convinced that adopting bitcoin is a good idea right we're okay with taking risks uh, we're okay with uh, being wrong on this and I guess the, the positive thing to say about a laggard, so the last adopter group, is that being a laggard can be helpful uh, in certain cases. It, it does help to be uh, traditional. For example, it, it helps to be a laggard in shitcoin country. Yeah. Right? You, you, you don't want to be an adopter there because you're going to be a fool. Right? So yeah. the, the conservative mindset helps people avoid risk. Because yeah. like in, in retrospect, we can pinpoint uh, out like the technologies like, okay, yeah, the iPhone was great. Uh, uh, that technology was great. Mobile phones were great. Yeah, be the first on Facebook, but that's in retrospect, right? There's a lot of innovators who jump on technologies that don't make it and get wrecked, lose money, or completely, you know, be on the wrong boat. So, so you know, there's a thing to say about this group too, you know, like it, it, they they avoid risk, um, and therefore also like avoid like making quick economic gains for sure. But you know there, there's there's something to say about that final group, you know. And I think a lot uh, of people they look at Bitcoin as a stock, and and so they go, well, I'm okay with missing it, and it, and I don't think they realize like, oh, and then they go, oh, I should have bought it a long time ago, and they don't realize one how early we are, and then two. There is no missing it. There's no missing Bitcoin. We're all going to eventually end up using it. And so you either use it now or you use it five years down the road. Um, and then wish you would have used it now when you said, oh, I wish I would have used it five years ago. To You know, it's 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 this weird thing of, you know, time. Time is just all relative. And the earlier you just start buying, the better it's going to help you understand more about it. But it just it does take time. It takes time for people for that thing to just click and for Bitcoin to solve their pain. 
just just to be a little bit self-critical as well, right? I mean, we're we're assuming hyper Bitcoinization, which basically, in my mind, is something like the euro and the dollar will collapse into Bitcoin, and we're all gonna like denominate everything in Bitcoin globally, and everybody's gonna be using Bitcoin instead of fiat, right? However, if you look at gold, right, there's always been like this cohort of the population as well that were gold bugs. And they always believed as well, you know, like everybody's going to end up using gold again. Just a matter of when they and if they see it, you know, it's just so in or even stocks, right? Like what you just mentioned, Sean, like I believe it's only about 20 to 30 percent as well of the population that invests in stocks. Yeah. The mass majority of the population doesn't own any stock, right? And if it's so obvious that you can make more money or become wealthier by investing in stocks, even if you leave a monkey pick out the stocks, as long as you hold them long enough, right? You always outperform the inflation. Then, you know, how come everybody didn't, you know, what about like this, this diffusion of technology theory that ult ultimately everybody will do it? it? It seems that like with stocks and gold, there's just this threshold of about like only 30% of the population will ever only own some. Like, what is there, you know, isn't there an argument to be made? I'm not trying to be super bearish here, but I'm just trying to, you know, be a little bit critical. But isn't there an argument to be made? I'm curious on your take, uh, Graffiti here, that like, you know, maybe Bitcoin will be like that. You know, maybe it won't make like 100 or 80% of the population. Maybe, maybe the, 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 total addressable market is that 30 percent cohort of the population so in that sense maybe we've already seen adoption going hyperbolic right because yeah everybody who's in finance and who is an investor probably owns some by now it, it's a good bear case yeah <laughs> well maybe it's it's contrib contributable to to this uh these lenses again right so you just think money is what what it has always been, right? Like uh, I, it, it's it's invisible also in so many ways, right? Most people won't have a look at the stock market, right, and see that it's like it has been going up for for so long. It, it requires some kind of um, financial literacy again. But but I think that's growing, isn't it? Like I think now with the advent of of YouTube and education online. I, I, I think it's growing. Probably there's more people in stocks these days than there were before. I, I don't have the data on that, but like that would, I think that that's. Yeah, that's I tend true. to agree with you, you know, with uh, things like Robin Hood and, you know, it becomes much more easier for people to just lower barriers where you can buy like parts of a stock instead of having to buy the entire stock. So even if you have $10, you can invest that $10 into like Amazon or whatever. I, so I, yeah. I tend to agree. I don't have the data either, but there's a point in that. But even then, you know, like um, there's a lot of people like literally just we had another meetup uh, here in Medellin a while ago. And one of the persons at the meetup was like, yeah, I'm interested, but I don't have any money. You know, I need to pay the, I need to pay the rent. So I don't, you know, Bitcoin doesn't make sense for me because I don't have any spare money to uh, to invest. So maybe, you know, all those people are in that situation, which unfortunately is a lot right they feel like oh, it's not for me investing in stocks is not for me investing in bitcoin is not for me because you need to have money to make you know to have it make sense because yeah even but, if even if then I you, you're almost $10, like dollars then i have 20 dollars. wow big deal you know? yeah so. yeah I, I guess you're saying like that, that that the fiat system is responsible for that too right like because people don't have any savings yes they're not incentivized to look look at the stock market or buy gold or buy Bitcoin. So so it's like the the monopoly yeah. of of paper money is 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 causing yeah. this. Like if people would it's... would have more time and, and more money on their hands, I guess they'll look for you know places to park it. Yeah, it's another exactly. way. If, if you know another... the money is gonna be sorry, Sean, I'll let you. I'll shut up in like a second. If you know the money is gonna be worth more into the future instead of like you making money and you getting a job that pays a hundred, right? But the inflation is going up and up and up. So every time, even though you manage to get that job uh, and then you get like a 2% raise, but inflation is 10%, you know, you're constantly, that is that oxygen being sucked out of the room metaphor that, that Sailor likes to use. You're constantly raising to keep up with the, the increased rate of inflation and money printing, right? So 
That's why people are stuck. If you're in a world where, hey, you realize that, hey, if I would have just saved that $10 back uh, 20, 30 years ago, it's not worth $1,000. I'm just exaggerating here. Then it's like, whoa, that could have meant the, the entire difference uh, to me altogether. That's why I do think uh, I was listening to the part of uh, Princey, you know, uh, Once Bitten podcast, and he had uh, Svetsky uh, on. And Svetsky apparently wrote a book together with, oh my God, I'm so sorry, I forgot Mark the Moss. other guy's name, Mark Moss. With, with Mark Moss. And they have this theory of like uh, Bitcoin adoption is a tree generational type thing where people really need to learn over generations what it is and what the benefits are. Because, you know, like on in the short term, Bitcoin is so volatile. People only remember it was 69K and now we're, so it's like, oh, we're down 60 or whatever the percentage is right now. You know, that doesn't help the benefit either is like, oh, you're telling me Bitcoin is a better savings vehicle. I put my money in there and now I'm down 60%. Oh, it's not really working. So, But you know, over the long run, they'll figure it out, right? But it takes a lot of time. And they have this theory that it takes three generations. And um, I, I haven't read the book, so I can't speak on, on all the details, but I thought it was an interesting uh, point yeah. of view. I, think I, all mean, of this... I mean, it totally... Go ahead. Sorry, no sorry. fighting. No I fighting. I just wanted to interject because because Marcus is such a bear, first of all. But uh, <laughs> I just wanted this. I think all of this depends on the fiat system, the dollar system specifically, because as the dollar system continues to go through inflation, like if it can keep itself around, then it's going to be harder for people to understand Bitcoin. And if it can't keep itself around, if it continues to just eat itself alive, well, then there's then people are going to feel the inflation and they're going to look for an alternative, depending on how high, like if it's at 10 percent for an extended period of time or if it goes up to 20 percent or 30 percent, people will definitely be looking for an alternative, whether they have savings or not. They'll be looking for, hey, just like how in other countries they want to transact in dollars. These people, people will be wanting to transact in Bitcoin, in my opinion, because there'll be so much inflation in the dollar and they won't know why that they want to transact in Bitcoin. They'll just know intuitively, subconsciously that it's better. And I think that's it's it's like the same. If you go to Argentina, you don't they don't really know why they want the dollar. They just know that they're that the Argentine peso loses value. You know, and but they don't really know the mechanics behind it. And I think that's the same way. All of this, like if it's a three generation thing, well, that means that the dollar doesn't really have much inflation for the next three generations. But if it does, then I think we see people moving towards Bitcoin a lot faster. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think you make a good point with like higher inflation will become more clear that um, the currency is not something you you would want to hold. Like, I guess like at higher rates, it will become more evident that there's something wrong, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, 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 and countries where you have a, uh, where you have higher inflation, you know, I, I guess it's like more custom to like look for look for um alternatives but uh yeah i also want to make another point with like uh tying this maybe back to rogers again that um the perceived value i guess probably is gonna be uh more visible in countries for example where you have unbanked people right because we we in in, in europe and united states and you know the the first world the western world like we 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 basically need bitcoin or evaluate bitcoin on its store of value uh property like for me in the netherlands like i don't really need a, a medium of exchange you know it's working quite well here with the legacy system uh, i don't necessarily have to transact with um uh, on lightning uh but the store of value is is like a big thing for me um, whereas I think, you know, maybe to make another bear case is that maybe the, the growth won't be as much in the Western world as it could be in developing nations, right? So El Salvador, for example, a lot of people are unbanked, right? 
Yeah. So Bitcoin is such an enabler there and the perceived value of Bitcoin is so much higher in those countries where the where the medium of exchange function is is just so big, right? So I I I'm assuming that like the early adopter phase is gonna happen there, where you know you have like the double whammy of the store value function and like a you know a mobile device where you can store your wealth and and zap it over to um, you know yeah, to I, I to, to purchase what, what, what phase do you think we're in? What phase do you think we're in right now? Like generally for Bitcoin? Yeah. Oh, er, innovator stage still. Innovator so for, yeah. Wow, that's amazing to think about. Don't you don't you think we're still that early? Yeah, because it's not really. It's there's still a lot to be developed on top of Bitcoin, and just yeah. per, percentage wise, I this is something I say. I still have yet to. I haven't met someone just randomly walking around, not at a Bitcoin conference, that's a full on Bitcoiner. I still haven't met someone like that that really gets with the issues that are going on. Which is pretty insane to me. Go ahead, Mark. You want, you want, yeah, you wanted to disagree, Mark. <laughs> I didn't want to disagree. I didn't disagree. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. did. Yes, <laughs> you like disagreeing. Just uh, no, like what you're saying, you know, that uh, the the double whammy of store value and 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 medium of exchange and like the global south or third world countries, you know, helping the unbanked. I just don't see it. And if I see it, then they're usually just transacting in stable coins, you know, and, and not Bitcoin. Um, and he, like, even here in Colombia, you know, it's like, uh, I was speaking to a local Colombian guy and, um, and he's like, yeah, in, uh, first of all, like my personal experience, I'm really somebody I ask every taxi driver, I ask every waiter, you know, everybody who, in the services industry, I always like, you want to tip in Bitcoin? And they're like, what? No, just give me, you know, they prefer dollars. Um, Bitcoin is completely not on their mind. And I think the El Salvador case as well, it's not like we, we, we tend to refer to El Salvador as an example, but, you know, if you look a little closer, and, and Sean, you've been there. You know, even the local El Salvadorians are like stepping away from Bitcoin, if anything, right? There was a lot of hype around the introduction. And yes, they know about Bitcoin, but a lot of people still prefer to have dollars or, you know, and, or, or not transact in Bitcoin. I just want to swap it, swap it back to, uh, to, to dollars because of its volatility. So I, yeah, I think, I, like I, I think the main, I think the main, forth. whether you're in the global South or not, and that's what the Colombian guy was saying too. He's like, no, no. Like a lot of people here have Bitcoin, but just to store their wealth, they're not trading it or buying coffee with it. That, you're just not seeing that at all. So I think yeah. we really have to first reach like a, a higher penetration or a higher adoption rate of using it at a store of value before we ever get to um, using it as you know a medium of exchange. We well, you don't. Know, do you so, know? You kind of explain Gresham's law because. A lot of people misquote Gresham's law and they say that it's good money pushes out bad. But his law was actually that bad money pushes out the good. And, yes. the, re and the reasoning is that all of the good money, people don't want to transact in it. They want to hold yeah, it. You want to hoard it. Right. Yeah. And so as you hold that money, you're like, no, I'd rather, I'd rather spend my fiat, right? I'd rather spend the money that's going down. I don't want to hold on to that. And everyone wants to transact in that, but then yeah, but the, that no one wants exactly. that money. And then they go, no, only the only thing accepted here is Bitcoin or is the good money. And so I think it also, it also comes back to explaining like the benefit, like, let's talk about like the benefit of Bitcoin. It's not, it's, you know, and like, whether it's like your own journey of learning about Bitcoin, or if you look at the history of Bitcoin and what the, the shitcoin narratives, you know, like there was this whole phase, which I feel is dying now, that it was about like transaction speeds, you know, like Ripple's founder constantly keeps talking about it. You have to fly a jet with money to Brazil if I want to send money from London to Brazil. It'll be faster if I fly, you know, but is that really the problem nowadays? Is like yeah. the transaction speed the problem? No, that's not the, the main benefit of the problem that, that it never Bitcoin was. solves. It's, it's about, you know, fiat money being the base because it's in control of governments who who sit on the spigot and they can control the the information and um, and the flow of money. 
and the flow of money. Give me one second, guys. My doorbell is going, so I'm going to hand the mic over. Yeah. So, so then basically, it's it's still an education thing then with with Bitcoin and and this price volatility. Then is like a, you know, it it's unfortunately not helping them. You know, like you know, maybe Bitcoin will need some more time to like stabilize because like the only way you're gonna like sit in it and and say like you know i'd rather have bitcoin than my stable coin it is if you have like a long term view maybe you have like more savings you could like park in it and you know like properly about its like qualities and you have like confidence it's gonna back up because of its fundamentals you know there's 21 million and it's gonna come back up and you know given the dollar is just less volatile you know it's it's depreciating but you know it's it it feels more safe you know like people it's more risky more perceived risk in in bitcoin you know it's just like going up and down too much so yeah i i I was also thinking uh you know the point that glenn marcus um put out with the volatility you know like I, i was wondering what if we didn't have halvings and and just uh bitcoin bitcoin would be like you know we like it would be like distributed till 2140 but like not in these like four-year shocks you know just like per block you know we're just gonna decrease it a little bit yeah every block decreases or something yeah i I wonder what what would have happened then you know like if we have like a parallel universe to test it i'm i'm curious you know we'll never we'll never know and then it's, <laughs> no, been, done. it's been done it's been that's, done <laughs> yeah and that's one of the yeah. genius things is this once every four years olympic like uh issuance shock to bitcoin just makes the price run up. i i feel that satoshi really hacked our our fear and greed there you know yeah. like Human because he, he's definitely somebody who would have thought about this and like, no, every four years or 210,000 blocks, I'm just going to do like a hard supply shock, right? Yeah. So because we, he, he probably envisioned that, you know, people might get bored or and then every time it's like, boom, you know? <laughs> and I mean, it no, has no, its pros and cons because maybe it's working too good, right? Because what happens is the price does run up. But then it causes such a massive inflow of like <laughs> people that the price shoots up even way higher, and then and then crashes by eighty percent, even yeah. though it's you know first gone up by three hundred or four or five, six hundred percent, whatever. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, if we let's say if we didn't have halvings and like the price would go up by point one percent every day. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that would be pretty chill too. Like, I think, you know, that would be like very steady for like, we, you, you'd probably yeah. still have like fluctuations. But, yeah. You, you know, yeah. Maybe Satoshi made a mistake, you know, by doing <laughs> <laughs> not maybe it keeps Bitcoin's price lower for longer. So it's actually more distributed, right? Who knows? Hey, I don't know how much time we have, but I, I'm just really curious. By the way, if you're enjoying the show so far, give us a like. Give us a comment. You know, we need adoption in this, uh, in right. this uh, program as well. So uh, do us a favor. Just hit the like button. Just say hello in the comments. Yeah, Tell us uh, what part you enjoyed or say something to Graffiti. Hey, Graffiti, I'm really curious, right? Because I remember 2020 and 2021. You know, sometimes like in when I post up, I'm, I don't have that much engagement. But then you see like there's these recurring likes from certain people. And I knew you were following me because I kept getting likes from this Michael Saylor graffiti looking kind of uh, avatar i think right now you're yeah, I, I grew my beard and, i grew my beard and you grew a beard and you have your santa hat on but um <laughs> like when what's with the name and uh, like are you a graffiti artist can you tell a little bit more about yourself and what you're doing uh, around that or where that came from yeah i mean i mean it's like it's more of like sort of my origin story i i have to say i don't do much with it currently i'm i'm mostly uh writing articles now for bitcoin but i I mean like graffiti sort of like means writing so i I guess i'm still doing it but uh no i guess when i first got like orange build uh and and sailor came on the scene you know like i was in such like a a state where i was like you know this is so bitcoin is amazing you know more people should know about it and 
I guess also maybe one of the things that sort of like slows Bitcoin adoption down perhaps is, is that it's not really visible, right? It, like imagine like the Ford car, you know, like, I mean, it was pretty clear there was something new on the scene and, you know, people could see its advantages and, you know, you could like drive quicker, you know, even there, there were issues there. But uh, I was like, you know, nobody sees Bitcoin, you know, there's nothing out there in meat space that like reminds you of uh, Bitcoin. So like, when I first really got into it, I was like, you know, it's kind of nice to like maybe see it more like on walls, you know, in, in, in cities. So that's how I sort of like got got started with it. And I, and I was like heavily impressed with uh, uh, Michael Saylor back then. So I was like, you know, like, let's let's cut something out, you know, like and, and put something on the street so that people can see. So that that's maybe that's that's mostly the reason why I got into it. It was sort of like a you know, like a escape valve for me, you know, like just to like show it and, and show my respect, uh, perhaps, you know, especially in the beginning, you know, like it, it felt like you're, you're the only one doing it and you just want to share the story. So it was sort of like a way to like get it more into the view, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's very interesting. I think you made a great point there that like Bitcoin is not visible as a technology, right? Um, yeah. yeah it's 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 not like your cellular phone you know where where you know it's the yeah where all of a sudden the, you see people on the bus using cell phones right? yeah. exactly like like evaluating bitcoin again through rogers framework that that is sort of a a problem you know and i'm also wondering if that would change over time you know if there would be like more physical ways where people see bitcoin in action you know who knows maybe fruit there like maybe mining at home really becomes a thing or people start shooting it around or maybe Noster, right where it's like more visible and integrated into uh applications i mean that that would definitely help you know like because otherwise you know when you see it and i know Noster is still like super niche you know for um people who don't want to use uh twitter but like i i hope to see like bigger applic like like that's the hope of lightning i think also you know just to make bitcoin more visible and have like more of like a maybe killer app kind of like i know store of value is the killer app but maybe more for the majority where yeah. people can see it you know can use it that that would change that would make a that would be a big deal i think yeah well my, my i kind of got to run pretty soon i want to ask one quite one more question because we normally do three questions at the end, uh, but we've had such a great conversation. We have time for one more. And this is kind of my favorite question to ask is, okay, we've all gone on the rabbit hole. We all believe that Bitcoin is here to stay. Uh, but what if we're wrong? And, you know, we have to be rational. Uh, what do you see as the biggest threat to Bitcoin? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I I think it's I think it's hard to stop. I think it's very hard to stop. I, I think I think maybe we might also underestimate. When, when I was watching, there was this like Indonesian governor on the Bitcoin conference, and I was I was like impressed with like how he came across and 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 you know he, he came across as like a good leader. You know, it was like and he was really like really? talking about like it. Well, I mean, like, I have to be honest, you'd rather I, not he, have, he, like, a dot. You go ahead. <laughs> I, I, he had a couple of red flags for me personally, to be completely honest. But, um, you know, when they asked him, what's your biggest achievement? He was like, I have so much million followers. Uh, he, mentioned putting, <laughs> he mentioned putting coffee on the blockchain. Uh, um, yeah, that was weird. That was weird. For he, sure. he kept yeah. repeating that he represents so much millions and that he's such that he's such a great leader. He came across very narcissistic to me. Let me put it that way. I mean, I could be completely wrong, and I want to give him the benefit of the doubt. But yeah, my gut feeling was like, ah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but, but anyway, uh, yeah, uh, but yeah. Know. I mean, the the point that I'm like, what I wanted to make was like, I, I, there's probably like a necessity uh beyond like in other countries where like the need is so high and like the reward for like being first is great yeah you know 
So mm -hmm. that, like the game theory part of it, right? There, there's like great incentive for the countries that are not dominant and have been like let down by the by the dollar to to do something. Yeah. You know what the it. weird thing about Indonesia is a, as well? They were, I believe the first house ever was sold in Indonesia for Bitcoin. And that was also the the moment or the catalyst that Indonesia decided to ban Bitcoin transaction. Wow. That you could that you could buy do purchases in, in Bitcoin because Apparently, in their history, they also had like this event where uh, like the IMF came down on them. And what happened was when that first transaction happened in Indonesia, uh, there was this article written in the New York Times or the Washington Post. I don't know, but it, it gained like this massive international uh, news. And the local government got scared by it because they were afraid that, you know, for like the powers that be, basically the IMF and the whole US dollar system, that they were going to get punished or sanctioned again. So they quickly moved wow. to. Um, uh, yeah. I'm excited. I'm going to go there. I'm going to be there next week. I'm going to be in Bali. So I'm going to hopefully That's get some cool. new insights on, uh, on Bitcoin and Indonesia firsthand. But yeah, we'll see. What, yeah, well, what, do, you, what do you think are like the, the main. Things that could like block Bitcoin's adoption. Marcus, you want to? Oh yeah, I don't. I don't know. You know, like I still hear Shezhe always in my mind. It was kind of that argument of no more than thirty percent of the population is gonna, you know, and the rest is just gonna sheepishly adopt the CBDC. You know, where the narrative of the government who wants to maintain control is going to be so strong and people are so happy to trust the government and don't want to take responsibilities for themselves so that Bitcoin will always be kept small into the hands of a few uh, rebels, you know, so to speak, that, you know, and that it will never reach that hyper Bitcoinized stage, but be kept relatively under control as, a, I don't know, you know, as, I don't know. It's hard to say. Obviously, I am also a believer of, you know, even though I come across bearish sometimes, Sean, the, my point I would just like to make, you know, which has been a learning like point for me in my yeah. journey since 2017 and, and this bull, this last bull run is that we were all way too bullish. You yes. know? Like, yeah. and everybody was very hard on calling each other a bear and, you know, we would never, ever see 20 or 30 K again. Right. And we we're going to go, I mean, in the end, I think, you know, people might have gotten hurt or learned hard lessons that way as well. You know, yeah. and look what happened with the Lunas and stuff. So I'm I'm a complete bull, a very high conviction. I think we will go gradually and then suddenly. That's still my thesis. But, you know, I'm also, I don't know, I got a reality check, you know, like. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think and if then... you look at Sailor, Sailor as well, you know, if Sailor got a reality check, yeah, if you go looking back at his first... Um, uh, podcasts and stuff and even like the the people that made me really bullish in the early days you know had to kind of like you know, change their narrative a little bit so we are all early at this nobody really knows yeah uh, we tend to be very bullish especially during a bull run and that's going to happen again again yeah, yeah. Uh, so if, if i can warn people it's just like just you know stay <laughs> oh here you go stay humble stack sats yeah but just it's Stay true. realistic, and uh, I don't think the world is going to change. Like boom. I mean, if you listen to if that theory holds any truth to it, that is a tree generational type thing. Um, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle between the people that say we're going to hyper Bitcoinize in five years or ten years, and other people saying it's going to take three generations. I think we have time. I think we have time to stack sats. I think we're gonna. We. I think we still definitely like what you're saying. It needs to be more visible. We should all post about it. Tell our friends about it. I don't. I think we under yeah, wear, wear estimate the value of letting other people know that you're a bitcoiner, right? And they're gonna see through time what the benefits of that are. Yeah, I see it around me, and I think that's more important than uh, a lot of people um, imagine it to be. Yeah, and, and I I'll, think to I'll make a good that, point, yeah. I mean, I mean, th that was also like one of the reasons why I wanted to look at Rogers, right? Just to like also be re a realist, perhaps, you know, just to say like, okay, maybe this thing isn't going as fast as I thought it would. You know, like at, at the beginning of previous bull, right? <laughs> I was like, I was looking at charts like, you know, $300,000 per coin yeah. easily, you know? <laughs> <laughs> licking your lips. 
yeah, <laughs> we're all too bullish. So, uh, so I, I think it's good to be level headed and like, yeah. you know, look, look at like, okay, where are like the hiccups now? Why, why isn't it going so fast? But you know, I, I'm optimistic, you know, like if there are, could be like build some like better or more interesting applications, like all the stuff that can still happen with the lightning network, other kinds of like applications and groups that might adopt it for reasons we haven't thought of yet. I mean, I mean, this was also a bit the thing with the internet, right? It was kind of like hard to gauge in the beginning, like what are the possibilities? So maybe it's just, you know, waiting for like a really good application of it. And, and, you know, maybe a, a thing like Noster is like bullish to me, you know, if you can like, zap around money like that it's it's pretty amazing but you know is that going to be the thing that's going to carry it beyond the critical mass i don't know all right well gentlemen it's been awesome i really do have to go right now uh we could talk for hours longer for sure. marcus give us some some final words let us know what's going on my my final words is always thank you so much uh graffiti it's great to uh to always meet plebs you know i love I love just seeing like new people come into the space. I mean, and new people, it's, everybody's new, right? And everybody's looking to 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 try to be a part of it. And I love that we get to connect and talk to so many plebs I see out there. That to me, it's it's a gift. I'd love to meet you one day. I mean, the conversation was great. And I'm really curious to hear what you're working on and um, if where people can find you. And you, you yeah, mentioned sure. an article that you're writing for Bitcoin Magazine or, or Citadel 21 or where? Yeah, give people, a yeah, handoff. Yeah. Give, give people a handoff where they can find you. Yeah, for sure. So my uh, Twitter handle is at Bitcoin uh, Graffiti. You can find me there. And I occasionally write for Citadel 21. Uh, shout out to Huddle and Odd. Unfortunately, that like that magazine is uh, stopping uh, and it was such a great uh, magazine so oh. i shouldn't see that yeah. go but uh, you know uh, let's Stack see if a bitcoin Stack magazine is like gonna accept my uh, uh, article so like yeah i'm mainly writing i'm i have a plan of like i'm also currently working on a novel but that that's like you know we'll need some time to like uh, finish it so like i, I want to sort of like integrate bitcoin with uh, with a story so stack we're working on that now. The Stack Chainers have a magazine as well that's coming out pretty soon. You should look into okay, that. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll check that out. So, uh, yeah, but otherwise, um, uh, you can find me on Twitter. Great. great. Awesome, awesome. Doing uh, Satoshi's work. I love yes. it. Graffiti, thank you again, man. Uh, it's been really awesome speaking to you, getting to know you a little bit better. You know, Marcus and I love doing this. And it's one of the biggest things is we just get to meet people like you. And so thank you. Thank you again for coming on. So um, for everybody else listening in, remember uh, the Meme Factory, we go live every Thursday, 7.30 p.m. That's with the rest of the crew. Uh, great fun show. And remember what you see here, what you hear here when you leave here. Don't just let it stay here. Please remember to share, like, subscribe. If you found something funny or educational or just want to help us out, leave a little comment. And uh, as for Bitcoin and Strat, episode 53 from Bitcoiner, from Bitcoin Graffiti, Plan Marcus, and Big Sean Harris, where we're now. Peace. <laughs>